Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath Services. With everything that's going on, everyone wonders what's going to happen and will I be alive next month or not? Well, let me just bring you up to date on a couple of things. In 2000, we were told that Y2K was going to kill all of us. 2001, the anthrax was going to kill all of us. 2002, West Nile virus was going to kill all of us. 2003, SARS was going to kill all of us. Nothing in 2004. We were all going to live. <laughs> 2005, the bird flu was going to kill all of us. 2006, E. coli was going to kill all of us. Nothing in 2007. That's amazing. 2008, the bad economy was going to kill all of us. 2009, swine flu was going to kill all of us. And by the way, the Chinese have had to kill so many swine because of the swine flu. And they were even speculating that because of all the smoke of burning all the over 100 million swine. And remember, the wind comes from the west to the east. And so all the swine back in the interior of China, all that smoke was coming in, mixing in with all of the smog that they have in China. And I don't know if you've seen any pictures of how much smog they have in China, but they have a great deal of it. Some even speculated, maybe this even added to the, to the coronavirus thing in China. Who knows? Okay. All right. 2010, BP oil spill was going to kill all of us. And as a matter of fact, they were so wrong in their scientific analysis because the salt water breaks down oil and produces a lot of things which causes growth and increased production of fish and so forth. Okay. 2012, the Mayan calendar was going to kill all of us. Nothing in 2011. 2013, North Korea is going to kill all of us. 2014, Ebola was going to kill all of us. 2015, the Disney measles and ISIS are going to kill all of us. 2016, the Zika virus was going to kill all of us. Nothing in 2017. Nothing in 2018. Okay. And nothing in 2019, but 2019 you have the coronavirus and 2020 you have. So, we have all those things threatening to kill us, but we're still here. And I hope all of you are in good health and are taking care of yourself and being careful where you go and what you do. God is going to protect us and watch over us, but we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves and do the things that are necessary. Now, for example, if you go on a trip, you're going to drive your car, you're going to put on your seatbelt because in case there's an accident, it will keep you from being tossed all around. However, you pray and ask God for a blessing and protection on your trip, even though you have your seatbelt on. So there's certain basic things we need to do when all of these things come around so that we take care of ourselves and not do stupid things ourselves. And remember, we don't want to do things to tempt God by saying, God, I know you're going to protect me in everything that I do, so I'm never going to wear my seatbelt. Now, you don't want to do that, okay?
Now, as we come closer to the Passover time, and many of us are going to have to take the Passover at home. So we have online at truthofgod.org, we have how to keep the Passover at home. Plus, we have sent out the CDs with the Sabbath before Passover, Passover, night to be much observed, first holy day, Sabbath during, and the last holy day, and the Sabbath after. So all of those are prepared for you so that if you have to stay home and you can't get out of your house, then you have it all right there, and God will bless you in it. So for this Sabbath, if you want a title for the message, it is Love, Mercy, and Forgiveness, and that's what we need. Now, the Protestants want to have all the love from God, but they don't want to love God back. So let's come here to 1 John, the fourth chapter, and let's see what we, what John has written here concerning the love of God and why we really need that. Okay? Now, verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God. Now, how do you test the spirit? Do they obey God? Because every one of the false ministers have, maybe, are led by a false spirit. I just got a, an email from a Catholic priest saying, because if you watch church at home, I'm not very kind to the Catholics on church at home. I challenge them on everything that they do. So he said, you just really misunderstand. See? Well, that's how you test them. Do they believe God? Not just believe in God, but believe God to obey him. That's the whole key. Now, whether they are from God or not, because many false prophets have gone into the world, now come down here to verse 5. They are of the world. Because of this, they speak of the world, and the world listens to them. Why? Because they have things which appeal to the flesh, which appeal to you receiving something from God with nothing that you have to do. But that's not what God desires. Remember what we read during the Passover night in John 14. Jesus said, if you love me, keep the commandments, name me my commandments. Okay? Now, verse 6. We are of God, and the one who knows God listens to us. And the one who is not of God does not listen to us. By this means. Now, this is how the test is done. We know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of deception. And that's what it is. Because even though scriptures are used, Paul warns against those in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, rather, chapter 2, those who falsify the scriptures. And there are many who do that. Now the next verse. Because of all that's going on. Verse 7. Beloved, we should love one another. Because love is from God. Our love, our emotions, everything that we have comes from God. And in him we live and move and have our being. And there's nothing that we have that didn't come from God. Even if it came through the hands of someone else who may have made it or built it, it still is working with everything that God has created. And everyone who loves 
has been begotten by God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. That's his very nature. Everything comes from it. You examine the Ten Commandments, and what is it all based upon? It's based upon the fact that God is love. See? That's why God says the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. That's an amazing thing. See? Now, that's not the whole commandment. The whole commandment is, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. Now, what is in Egypt? All the false gods of this world. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. That's based on love, because God wants to bless us. God wants to love us. But God is not going to love us with the love that we want to have if we go against God. Because if we go against God, his love obligates him through the laws that he has created to correct us. And just look what is going on in the world today. The world is leaving God more and more and more. And so what happens? We got a pandemic. And guess what that does? It drives people to look for God. So let's hope that has a good effect here, especially in America. Now, I don't know if you saw it on television the other day, but based upon the prayer of Solomon for the children of Israel, he said that when this, your people turn to you in time of trouble, you will hear and answer. And remember, Israel was never called to salvation. But there are many Protestant ministers working with the president, and they have regular prayer meetings. Now, as those prayers are sincere, God will hear because God is interested in the nation, not only for the sake of his promises to Israel, but also for the greater sake of having the gospel preached to the world, because the only place in the world it's coming from, brethren, is from the United States of America. So you might look at Protestantism, even though there are a lot of false things they have, which limits their contact with God without a doubt, nevertheless, we can look at that as kind of the state religion of Israel. And so we will see how that goes. But remember, that doesn't mean that they're called to salvation. That just means that God is dealing with the nation. Being called to salvation is an entirely different thing. Let's go on. In this way, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And what is one of the first things we are looking for when we come to God? Help and forgiveness, right? Yes, indeed. Verse 10, in this act of love, and that's what we study about with the Passover, everything that Jesus did, right? And everything that he suffered through. And he said that he laid down his life willingly himself. And with the covenant that he had with the Father, he would receive it back when he had finished everything he needed to do, and that's what happened with the resurrection. Okay? Now, he sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And remember, 
the very purpose of why we're here and where we're going and what we are doing is for the preparation to work under Jesus Christ with all the saints and all the plan of God to save the world, starting with the millennium and the return of Christ. In this act of love, not that we love God, rather he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation means a continual source of mercy and forgiveness and atoning upon repentance. Okay. And that's what it's all about. Let's come back here to 1 John, the second chapter, and we will see this. He says it again here. Verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And yet, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, if you have sins that you have done, you need to come to God through Christ and the shed blood of Christ and your repentance. God will forgive you. You will see, you will receive his mercy. We'll see that as we go along here. Now notice, the advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. Now, lest we get conceited, and lest we get selfish, and lest we forget the plan of God, see, it's not like some of the religious groups say, that only in this group, you're going to be saved and all the rest of the world is going to be burned up. Not true. Because God's plan includes the vast majority of all mankind in the schedule that he is determined by what the meaning of the holy days depict for us. Okay? Now notice. And not for our sins only but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, that's quite a thing. See? But it's not yet time for the whole world. That's why we're called the first fruits. Now, back to 1 John 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, because he did this before we even existed, we also are duty-bound to love one another. So that's why there's forgiveness. And we're going to see if we want forgiveness for our sins, which we do, then we need to forgive those who have sinned against us. We'll see that. That's a big thing with God. Very important. Okay? Now, let's see how Jesus expressed it in a little different way. Let's come to Matthew, the ninth chapter. Matthew 9. Now, Jesus did not hang out with the scribes and Pharisees and doctors of the law. And you think about it for a minute. Even his birth, totally miraculous, yes, indeed. But even his birth, it didn't come with fanfare to the world. It didn't come with announcement to the high priest. It didn't come with a grand reception of all the religious dignitaries when he came to the temple during the Passover season of his first year of his ministry. No, didn't. And when he was born, who did God reveal who Jesus was to two shepherd boys out watching the flock. Amazing, isn't it? Okay. Now let's come here to Matthew 9 and let's pick it up in verse 10. Okay. Then it came to pass when Jesus sat down 
to eat in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And after seeing this, the Pharisee said to his disciples, Why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, if he came to save sinners, why shouldn't he? So here's what Jesus said. Verse 13, 12, rather. But when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are strong do not need, have need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now, there's a physical sickness and there's a spiritual sickness. And many of the spiritual sick don't know that they're spiritually sick. And that describes the Pharisees. Let it not be us. Let us always come to God with repentance and forgiveness every day. Okay. Then he said, I want you to learn this lesson. Now go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's what it's all about. Okay. Now then, that's quite an interesting thing. Let's, let's come back here to Isaiah, very last chapter in of Isaiah, Isaiah 66. And let's see to whom God will look. See? It's not the high and mighty. Yes, God has a standard with the different nations. And he works with them in different ways. Look at what happened with the Ninevites when Jonah went to preach to them that God was going to destroy them. They all repented in sackcloth and ashes. But that was not under conversion. That was to the acknowledgement of God that he rules in the nation. Okay. Now, on an individual basis, Isaiah 66, let's begin in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? That's quite an interesting thing, isn't it? For all these things my hand has made. Now think about that. As beautiful as the temple was, everything about the construction and decoration and how it was made and everything, those plans came from God and were made of things that God created. See? So God wants something greater to honor him than what he has created in the physical world. So what is that? Let's see that. Okay. But to this one will I look. You want God to look at you? Hear your prayers? Give you understanding? Bless you? Love you? Here it is. But to this one will I look to him who is of a poor and contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Okay. Now, that's a repentant attitude. Now, why is that important? Because repentance is a choice. And since God has given us free moral agency, he wants us to use that agency to willingly come to him, to willingly repent. And we'll see a little later for forgiveness for removal of sins, for blessing of his spirit, 
And that's all what the whole Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread is all about. Quite a thing indeed. Okay? Now, let's come to John 15. John 15, we've covered the scriptures quite a bit leading up to the Passover about how much we are to love God, and that is with all our heart, mind, and soul, and being, and strength. And so, in loving, one, loving God, rather, with all our heart, mind, and soul, and being, we're going to see that ties right in with loving each other. Because love first must come from God. See? And with God's spirit and God's love in you and reaching out to the brethren and whoever else is in your life, that love is motivated by God's spirit, just like John said. The one who loves has been begotten by God. The one who does not love has not been begotten by God. Okay? So, Let's see how Jesus explained it here in John 15. Verse 1. I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. So remember what we saw there in John 14, that the father and the son, a uh, spirit, the two parts of the spirit of God, are dwelling in us. That is their abode, their dwelling place. And Paul wrote that each one of us are a mini temple of God. That is where the Spirit of God is dwelling. And we know that that is to become the sons and daughters of God. But it has to be from the Father and Son, both working with us. So Jesus said, I am the true vine and my Father is the husbandman. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit. Well, we've seen that, haven't we? Yes, indeed. But he cleanses each one that bears fruit in order that it may bear more fruit. God wants us to bear a lot of fruit. Remember the parable of the pounds and the parable of the talents and the parable of the sowing of the seed. That's what God is interested in, and that's by using our free moral agency and will to love God back and then to love one another. And that's a key command given in John 13 on the Passover night. And what we're reading here in John 15 is continuation on that Passover night. Okay. Verse 3. You are already clean through the word that I have spoken. Dwell in me. That's the important thing. How do you dwell in Christ? By loving him, by loving the Father, because the Father is the one who is directing the vine and Jesus is the vine. And how do we do that? Through prayer, through study, through living, and through whatever we go through. Because it doesn't matter what we go through. Paul writes that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, which we have been. Verse 4 again, Dwell in me and I in you, Jesus said, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but only if it remains in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you are dwelling in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Now think on this for just a minute. Can a branch tell the vine what to do? Now think on this. Because there are a lot of, lot of, lot of people who think that they, they can do something that is so good that God must bless them. God must work with them. Now we'll see that in just a little bit here because that's quite a thing, okay? 
God will take care of it, okay? I'm the vine, you are the branches. The one who is dwelling in me and I in him, see, it's always reciprocal, constantly moving, constantly between God and us and us and God. Just like alternating current all the time, all the time, all the time. Bears much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, why don't you do this? Just to learn a point, and especially with your children. Okay? We have the Feast of Unleavened Bread coming up. Okay? Go out and break off a branch of a tree or a plant and bring it in the house and just lay it on the shelf and have it there all during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And every day, look at that branch cut off from the tree. What happens to it? First couple days, it looks pretty good. About the third day, it starts looking pretty bad. And by the time you get to the eighth day, which it is when you count Passover and seven days of unleavened bread, it's worthless. So think about that spiritually. We must always be connected with Christ. Okay? The one who is dwelling in me and I in him bears much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Okay? If anyone does not dwell in me, he is cast out as a branch and is burned up and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you dwell in me. Now notice the if. That applies to us. And my words dwell in you. Now that's a very important statement in there, isn't it? See? Why? Because with the Spirit of God, what is God doing? He's writing his laws and commandments in our hearts and in our minds. That's the whole purpose of unleavened bread, the truth of God in our hearts and mind to get rid of the carnality and the sin within. If you're dwelling in him, you shall ask whatever you desire and it shall come to pass for you. And this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the, Now notice this. Notice this. Now, if you feel you don't have enough of love of God coming to you, take these sections of Scripture, open it up, get on your knees, read them, pray about them, ask for God's love and spirit to stir you up, to lead you, to guide you, to help you in everything. Okay? That will help you. As the Father has loved me, did the love, Love of the Father ever diminish? No. Did it ever cease? No. Did Jesus ever not love the Father? Of course not. He always loved him. I also have loved you. Live in my love. That's what God wants. Now, John, who wrote more about love than any, any of the other apostles, he and his brother James were called the sons of thunder. And they were the ones who came to Jesus when one of the villages of Samaria did not really receive Jesus as they wanted him to receive him. They came to Jesus and said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them up like Elijah? Now, that was before they were converted. So John had to learn an awful lot about love. And his brother James was beheaded in 44 AD. Okay. Notice. Here's the qualifier. Here's how you know. Not only prayer and study, but, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and live in his love. Now then, let's see 
something really, really important here. Let's come back to Job, the 31st chapter. Job 31. Quite a chapter indeed. Now, in this chapter, there are 28 my and me, 23 I's, and 15 ifs. Now remember, in the letter of the law, Job was one of the most righteous persons on earth. But what did his righteousness motivated by what he was doing due to his relationship with God. Instead of always looking to God, he began to look to himself and what he would do. So in this terrible trial he was going through, he couldn't understand why, why it was happening. I haven't sinned. I haven't done anything wrong. But he didn't see his own rebellion. And he didn't see that he was thinking he was as good as God. Now notice chapter 31 here. This is something. I made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look upon a virgin? What is the, the portion of from God above. What is the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction for the wicked and calamity for the workers of iniquity? But me, look at me, I'm suffering. Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity or if my foot has hurried to deceit, let me be weighed in the balance so that God may know that I am blameless. Nothing here that God gave me the ability to do this or that. Nothing here that I thank God that I could help this person or that one. See? Let's go on. Verse 7. If my step turned out of the way or my heart has walked after my eyes, or if any spot has cleaved to my hands, then let me sow and let another eat and let the harvest be rooted out. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I had laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down before her or upon her. For that would be a heinous crime, yea, it would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. Okay? Come down here to verse 13. If I have despised the cause of my maidservant or my, my manservant or maidservant when they complained against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he calls me to account, what shall I answer him? Now, see, he didn't know he was prophesying his fate in just a little bit. See, because God's going to call him into account. Did not he who made me in the womb make him all also? And did not one fashion us in the womb? If I have withheld from the poor their desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel myself alone, and the fatherless has not eaten of it. For from my youth I grew up, he grew up with me, as with a father, and from infancy I guided her. If I have seen any perish for the lack of clothing, or there was no covering for the needy, if 
his loins were not have not blessed me and he warmed himself with the fleece of my sheep if i have lifted up my hand against the fatherless and have watched over my help to the gate then let my arm fall from the shoulder blade and let my arm be broken from their elbows how righteous was he see what if we do something that is a marvelous thing or do what God has commanded us to do? Should we take that and go to God and say, look at how great I am? No. We need to go to God and thank him that we were blessed to do it and that God did it. Okay? Verse 23. For a calamity from God is a terror to me, and by the reason of his majesty I could do nothing. If I had made gold my hope, or have called fine gold my confidence, if I had rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because my hand had gotten much, if I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon when it uh, brightness, and my heart had not Secret, and my heart had been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand, then also would be iniquity for the judge to punish, for I would have lied to God who is above. So look at all the things that happened there. You can go on and, and read all the rest of it. Come down here to verse... 33, if I covered my sin like Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, then let me tremble before a great multitude and be terrified by the scorn of families, and I will be silent and not go out the door. I am so good, he said, I can take anything. Really? All right. Oh, verse 35. Oh, that I had one to hear me, behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and the indictment that my adversary had written. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it like a crown upon my head. I would declare to him the number of my steps, like a prince I would come before him. Wow. So you see, this kind of attitude requires the trouble that he went through. Okay? Now, he went on even more. Come here to chapter 38. 38. Now, I want you to keep in mind Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Okay? because we see a change coming right here, beginning. Okay. Verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, God gave him his desire. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, for I will demand of you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it if you have understanding. Who has determined the measurements if you know? Or who has stretched out the line upon it? On what are the foundations fastened to? Or who laid the cornerstone? Okay. Who did all of this? Okay. That's why today it's marvelous that we can have these wonderful pictures of the universe and the great beauty that God has made. Well, after God got done talking with Job, then Job got the point. So let's see this and let's understand this. As difficult as this was for Job, 
it was for his betterment because God blessed him with double that he had in the beginning. So look at that. Any trial that you have, God will bless it in the long run if you learn from the trial. Okay. Job 40, verse 1. Job 40, verse 1. And the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he who contends with the Almighty instruct him? Now this is a great lesson, because one of the greatest sins of human beings is that they think they can do something so good that God has to accept it because he didn't think of it or do it. That's nonsense. He who reproves God, let him answer it. And Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I'm vile, repentant. What shall I answer you? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. And the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now here is the great lesson that we never get lifted up and puffed up in vanity and greatness of how good we are or what we've done. Okay? So God said, Gird up your loins now like a man. I will demand of you and you declare to me Will you annul my judgment? Isn't that what men do when they change what the word of God says and means? Yes. Will you condemn me so that you may be righteous? And isn't that what men do? Why do we have constantly all of these attacks on the word of God? The doctrine and nature of God, the calendar, the Sabbath, the holy days, all of these things, because there are men out there who think that they know more than God, rather than saying, yes, God, these things you have commanded, please help us understand what they mean and repent like Job. Okay. So then he challenges them challenges Job, if you think you're so strong, if you think you're so mighty, if you think you're so good, deck yourself now with majesty and excellency and array yourself with glory and beauty and cast the rage of your wrath abroad and behold everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in darkness. Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. See? Now, Job had to learn that lesson. That's a great lesson for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So think of how, through the years, Job built this up and built this up and was raised to the highest levels of whatever he was doing that he thought he was getting close to being God. And then God answered him. And then what did he say? Chapter 42. Okay. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no thought can be withheld from you. Okay, now come down here to verse 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. In other words, he really understood how bad he was. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And so that's how even the most self-righteous can overcome. Even the one who has done terrible and horrible, horrible things can repent and overcome. 
And that's what repentance, mercy, and forgiveness is all about. So let's take a break and we'll come back. Mm -hmm. 